Welcome everyone to today's APSC Cath Lab workshop. Today's focus is PCI in diabetic patients. This event is uh, brought to you by the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology. The date stamp today is the 1st April 2022 on a Friday, 3 p.m. Singapore time. The event is hosted at Sengkang General Hospital, supported by the Singapore Cardiac Society, the PCI chapter, EBEC accredited for CME points in collaboration with Medtronic. My name is uh, Jack Tan, the immediate past president for the APSC and your chair for today from Singapore. We're also very happy that again, we we'll get uh, hosted for this event at Sengkang General Hospital. And this is my heart center at uh, Sengkang Cardiology Care Lab team. The first speaker to open up the session will be Dr. Steve Vernon from the North Shore Private Hospital, New South Wales, Australia. He's going to speak to how do I make revascularization durable in diabetic patients, tips, tricks, and best practices. The second speaker today is Dr. TK Ong from the Department of Cardiology, Sarawak Heart Center, Malaysia. He's then going to give a very difficult talk about how to make sense of guidelines and trials, clearing the confusion where the evidence lie. Today's uh, live operators are my bosses. Professors Aaron Wong and Lim Sutek, respectively our Deputy Medical Director and uh, Head of Cath Lab at the National Heart Center Singapore. They are going to be assisted for live imaging narration by Professor Chin Chi Yang, also a good colleague of mine at Heart Center. The coordinator for today's session is Dr. Ke Yen Sun. Our panelists from across the region today will include Dr. Raj Rajagopal from Glen Eagles, JPMC Brunei. Dr. Yang Wen Yi from the Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine, China. Dr. Ngoi Min Hang from Chorei Hospital, Vietnam. Dr. Pham Tian Ming from the National Heart Center, Singapore. Dr. William Cristando from Ng Ting Fong General Hospital. And last but not least, it's, it's kind of nice to have this perspective from Professor uh, Theo Kofidis, the head of the Cardiothoracic Surgery Department and National University Heart Center, Singapore. A pitch for upcoming webinars. 22nd April, we have a complex ECG APSC reading session together with Professor Chin Chi Kyung and Professor Joseph Brugada to teach us on ECG advanced reading. 30th of April, we have a session on advanced and demon type level calcium management in coronary intervention. A disclaimer, this content is copyrighted by the APSC. The views and opinions expressed belong solely to the faculty members. This content is currently made live stream via Wonder, APSC Facebook and YouTube pages. CME points will then be submitted for registrants who are connected throughout the full Zoom duration. You will then receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey post webinar. For attendance calling in, please click onto the Q&A button if you have any questions to ask our panel. Let me say the objectives of today's session. One, we want to share insights, tips and tricks for PCI interventions in our diabetic subset of patients. We also want to choose the correct treatment revascularization options, balancing between current practice and evidence-based medicine. And last but not least, we want to learn how to manage a patient post PCI effectively. So let's get started and jump to Dr. Steve Vernon from Australia to open us up for the best tips and tricks in diabetic PCI. Steve, please. Thank you. I'll just uh, start sharing my screen just a moment. I should. Yeah, go ahead. We're seeing you well. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, thanks so much for the uh, invitation um, uh, to give this talk and, and to join you at this webinar. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, the, the multiple talks and also the, the case of cases, of course. Um, so I was given the topic about how do I make revascularization durable in diabetic patients and, and what tips and tricks do I have? Um, so I've got, I've got a few that we'll go through and I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion, um, particularly around the, the cases. Just briefly uh, myself, so I'm a, a coronary interventionist at, at Royal North Shore and North Shore Private Hospitals um, in Sydney, um, which is you know, located probably about five kilometres north of the, the CBD. 
um, where a, a primary PCI centre as well as a busy coronary and structural centre. Um, and yeah, this is where I've, I've done a lot of my training and, and where I'm working now. So getting on to um, the topic and, and just briefly some background, but I know that, that Dr. Ong is gonna cover a lot of the, the evidence um, going forward. So we'll, we won't spend too long on, on background, but we'll move forward to you know, those tips and tricks. But you know, when we think about diabetes in coronary uh, and coronary disease, um, we all know that diabetes is, is a key risk factor uh, for the development of coronary disease, um, but it's also well established that, that those um, diabetics with coronary disease uh, often have more rapid progression, um, often have more uh, spread and, and more severe disease and involving um, multi-vessels um, and, and you can have, have difficulties sometimes with, with results and, and long-term outcomes with, with PCI. So um, optimizing our, our PCI is obviously very important. And again, not to, to steal Dr. Ong's thunder, but um, in terms of when we think about revascularization in, in diabetics or patients with diabetes, look, the indications um, for revascularization are largely the same, you know, for those with or without diabetes with, with some difference in perhaps recommendations for um, certain scenarios in terms of the type of revascularization, which I'm sure we'll come to. Um, we know that diabetics, you know, whether they have PCI or cabbage, um, their rates of recurrent events and requiring revascularization in particular are higher than, than patients without diabetes. And that's why um, there's a real need to, to optimize um, if possible. Um, in terms of the, the increased risk, why is that? I've already alluded to that. They often have more advanced coronary disease when we, at the time that we're doing the intervention. Um, it progresses more rapidly and they also often hand in hand with diabetes goes, goes other risk factors, you know, such as hypertension and hypercholesterolemia and, and other factors. We've touched on this, um, but you know, the, the main indications, I suppose, for, for revascularizing, um, which everyone's familiar with um, currently, uh, and this is in stable patients, which I'm, I'm focusing on rather than um, the ACS setting. Uh, so patients with activity limiting symptoms, despite medical therapy and maximal tolerated therapy, um, those who are really wanting to uh, improve their quality of life, um, you know, maybe not tolerating, you know, maximal therapy even from a medical perspective and those with anatomy that's you know been shown to, to benefit and in particular we think of those with with left main significant left main disease so greater than 50 percent um, those with multi-vessel disease particularly in the context of reduced ejection fraction in terms of the you know coronary artery bypass versus pci and again I won't go in detail but in general um, you know, when you've got diabetics with multi-vessel disease and a high syntax score, so a high degree um, of, of complexity, um, you know, it's been shown that they have better long-term outcomes, you know, with bypass. Um, but those with, with low syntax score um, and particularly those with more focal lesions, um, and if it's only, you know, only involving one or two vessels, you know, PCI can be a, still be a, a very good option with, with good outcomes. Why do um, patients with diabetes not necessarily uh, do as well as our other patients post PCI? Um, you know, they're at increased risk of, of target lesion restenosis, um, and they also have more diffuse disease um, and a greater risk of progression in non-target regions as well. And so I was pleased, you know, to hear that you know part of the discussion, which I won't go in in detail, is obviously the, you know the aftercare. Um, and, and optimizing our patients' medical treatment as well as risk factor modification is so important. Um, and it's not all about, you know, optimizing that stent. There's, there's much more to optimizing outcomes for our patients. So coming to the, the tips and tricks, and, um, you know, I guess I've alluded to the first bit, and, uh, but I think it is important if, you, if we're going to perform PCI in diabetics, we've got to try and pick the right patients. Um, and, and we'll go through the evidence in, in the, the next talk um, about that. We've then got to pick the right or treat the right lesions, um, you know, particularly when we think of people that have fairly diffuse disease or multi-vessel disease, making sure that the lesions we treat are going to, are going to benefit 
uh, benefit the patient and get good outcomes. And then strategies to, to optimize our PCI, which are relevant across our practice, um, but particularly in, in diabetics, I guess, because we know that they're more prone to having stent failure um, and, you know, both target and non-target revascularization, but particularly target, um, you know, I guess we've got even more to gain by, by using these optimal techniques, which I'll come to. And I already alluded to op optimal secondary prevention, which is just, you know, so important. In terms of picking those right lesions, um, you know, we're all, all familiar, or at least I think most of you would be familiar with a lot of the, the pressure wire studies, in particular the FAME, FAME 2, um, you know, with regard to, to FFR and FFR-guided PCI, the setting of multivessel disease versus angiography alone um, was shown to um, decrease a combined endpoint of death, MI, and repeat vascularization. Um, and that was a mixed cohort of patients with and without diabetes. Um, but sub studies have shown that, it, you know, that's relevant to, to diabetics in terms of that finding. Um, you know, the FAME2 study showed that FFR guided PCI, um, and that was comparing to optimal medical therapy, uh, you know, perhaps not, not as quite a, a stronger finding, but resulted in fewer urgent revascularization procedures. And then the Define Flare study comparing IFR to FFR um, showed that IFR was not inferior. Um, and again, they've had a diabetic sub study. Um, which although it showed higher MACE in diabetics, um, that was in whether they had the IFR or FFR and there was no statistical difference uh, between the two, two arms in, in diabetics as well. But I think using pressure wire um, to, to make sure that the, the lesion that you're treating, you know, obviously if it's a high grade stenosis, no need, but if you're in that intermediate um, moderate, moderate zone, I'm um, using pressure wire to make sure that that, that lesion needs treating um, is a great way to help pick the right lesions. In terms of um, optimizing PCI, you know, I, I, I've alluded to stent failure and, and early stent failure or late stent failure. And, and I guess the, the studies show that the, the key to, to avoiding this is having adequate stent expansion, um, in particular, looking at that final stent area. Um, and I'll come to the, some of the numbers which are helpful for this. You know, it's, it's the inadequate stent expansion is the most reliable predictor of future stent-related events, both restenosis or acute or later thrombosis. Um, and, and the best way to, to de determine um, your optimal stent size and, and adequate expansion is, is by using intravascular imaging. Um, and again, this applies to, to diabetics and not, but I think we've just got, um, you know, particularly in diabetics, so much to be gained by, by using intravascular imaging to, to optimize our PCI. So, you know, at what stage should we use um, intravascular imaging? And, and I think it's important to, to use it both in, in your planning, but also in your post-stenting to, to ensure that you've had a, you know, adequate and, and a good outcome. Um, so in your, in your planning stage, I mean, obviously, if it's a tight lesion, you may not be able to get your um, imaging catheter across. So you may need to do some initial pre-dilatation um, to even get the imaging catheter across. But I think it's really helpful to, to characterize the plaque um, in terms of do you have a, a more lipid-rich plaque or are you dealing with significant calcification? Um, because this is going to um, help determine, you know, whether you're going to need to do some some pre-modification, particularly in the, in the context of calcification to make sure that you've got adequate um, you know, pre-dilatation and, and preparation of, of, the, of the lesion. So it's really important uh, you know, as, as interventionalists that we're uh, familiar and comfortable with, with intravascular imaging. Um, obviously OCT and, and IVIS are the, the two mainstays. Um, Look, there are advantages and disadvantages of each, and, and that's a topic for, for another day. Um, but I think, you know, certainly being comfortable with one, ideally with both, and knowing the advantages and, and disadvantages and when to use them, um, you know, really is going to optimize and, and sort of lead you to, to having better outcomes for your patients. So it's important to be able to interpret the images and, and the type of plaque that you're seeing, um, interpret normal vessel. Um, ideally being able to identify the, um, the EEL, the external elastic lamina, um, in terms of for measurement, and, and we'll come to that shortly. Um, being able to identify 
the, you know, the difference between lipid, um, fibrous tissue, and, and particularly calcified plaque um, is important, as I said, for your lesion preparation. I said before that there, you know, there are some advantages and disadvantages of, of IVUS and OCT in different settings, um, which you know, many of you or most of you would, would be familiar with. Obviously, particularly in the setting of, of left main, which is obvious, which is often a, or it is a, you know, a larger vessel, um, you know, IVUS is often required to, to be able to get adequate um, imaging and certainly the evidence is there for IVUS in that setting. Um, with OCT, it can be hard to, to get adequate um, clearing of the vessel and, and adequate imaging in OCT, and there's not as good of evidence in that setting. Um, OCT can be particularly helpful if you're dealing with instant recent stenosis or, um, or calcium and, and depths of calcium, that sort of thing. But really, you know, being particularly, you know, if you're not using either, but I'm sure most people are using one or both, um, you know, become really familiar and, and comfortable with, with one. And, and then, you know, learning the other and learning, you know, when to use it. Uh, in terms of your planning, you know, I've alluded to, to lesion preparation and, and being guided by intravascular imaging. And I think that's, that's really important that you've got adequate pre-dilatation, working out, do you need calcium, calcium modification? And, you know, I haven't seen the case yet today, but, you know, I think likely we'll, we'll be dealing with some of these issues that I'm talking about in, in the talk. Um, you know, do you, will you need rotational atherectomy or, or these days, you know, the, the advent of lithotripsy has been a real game changer, um, particularly when you're dealing with circumferential calcium. Um, and it can also be, you know, a real lifesaver if, if, you've, if you haven't followed this and you, and you haven't got adequate, um, you know, stent lesion preparation and you've stented and you've got under expansion and your, your post imaging shows that, you know, there's still significant calcification. The great thing about the, the lithotripsy balloons is that you can use them within stent and get and still get a good outcome. But using it up front in, in lesion preparation is obviously the ideal. And then in terms of the planning phase, um, sizing your stent. And, and again, we're, we're all used to doing that on um, angiography. Um, but I guess the difficulty with angiography is you're seeing that, that lumogram um, and whilst we use different angles to try and improve it, improve our estimation, um, we really know that, that often we don't get it as good as we think we do. And an intravascular imaging can really improve your stent sizing. Um, so in terms of sizing your stent, important that you measure your, your distal reference and we tend to measure in, in two planes. As I said, ideally, if you can see the EEL, you would measure that um, and then come down a, you know, a stent size from that. If you, if you can't make out the EEL clearly, then measuring the lumen and going up um, is generally the way to go. Importantly, you measure your, your, dist or your proximal reference as well, um, particularly if you're crossing, um, you know, crossing branches um, so that you can optimize your proximal stent and, and do your, your pod technique. But it's, and it's also gonna help you make sure um, that you're picking good landing zones. Um, so ideally disease-free, although that can be difficult in diabetics with fairly diffuse disease. So again, we're, I'm probably running a bit short of time, but in terms of your baseline imaging, so just to recap, so you, um, you want to assess for, you know, calcified clark or other difficulties that may require special attention in your lesion prep. Um, you want to measure accurately to size your stent, and then you want to measure your length. And, and if you've used one of the um, imaging-based uh, pullback systems, um, then you can measure on that. But otherwise, your traditional way of, of sizing with your balloons in, in your angiogram is, is obviously still relevant and just in your mind, if you don't have co-registration, um, you know, knowing where you are on, on your imaging from your measurements. And as I said, from the post um, stand optimization, even from your baseline imaging, you're going to size your non-compliant balloons for that proximal part of the stent based on those measurements. And then afterwards, once you've deployed the stent and you've done your, your, your proximal optimization, um, doing another intravascular imaging run and, and, and assessing your, your stent is going to be really important. And as I've said before, the, the, the key is, is adequate stent expansion um, and, and making sure that you know, you're, you're reaching those targets. So ideally, 
90% um, of your MSA, if not 80%, and you can split the, the stent in your mind in half and in terms of the proximal and distal references. So it's the MSA to the proximal or the distal. Checking for ad adequate apposition of the stent is going to be important. Uh, and then, you know, making sure that there's not um, significant dissection. And, and the things we tend to think about are um, more than three millimetres in length and more than a quadrant um, of you know of your of your clock face it would often need covering but also the, you know the andrographic appearance is also quite important and your operator experience in terms of that is also important geographic miss if you if you've landed in a segment of disease that you just didn't pick maybe the patient took a deep breath and it moved right at the last minute obviously important that that you reassess and make sure that you're you've got an adequate landing landing zone and if you need to putting a second stent with overlap uh, so this is again just thinking about that that post um, stent implantation um, intravascular imaging and, and making sure that you're getting a, a really good result because this is what's going to um, optimize the outcome for your patients and you know in combination with those other factors we've spoken about in particular their post hospital hospital care um, but in terms of what you're doing in the cath lab you know these are the things that that's going to optimize their, their outcome so you want to get really good um, expansion of the stent and make sure that you're happy with that. So in terms of the, you know, the take-home messages, and they really are, you know, and, and I think that the second talk will probably be more helpful for this, picking the right patients, and that's why I didn't delve into that, picking the right lesions um, and targeting those lesions um, and not relying solely on angiography. And then definitely using intravascular imaging to, to optimize your, your planning and, and your stem implantation. So I might open it um, back for, for, for discussion with the panel. Thanks, Steve. Uh, maybe I can ask you to stop share. Uh, sure. Thanks for giving us this uh, opening uh, lecture. Actually, I like your take home messages and maybe we take a step back first to just discuss around the topic. Um, perhaps you can start off with Professor Theo Kofidis. He's a cardiac thoracic surgeon. Uh, and it'd be great to hear his perspective on this group of patients, really. Um, maybe you can give us a perspective of who you think is most likely to benefit from any form of revascularization, particularly surgery uh, in, in your practice. Theo, please. Well, um... My cordial regards to everyone from Paris, where it's early morning right now and uh, uh, chilly cold with snow outside, believe it or not. <laughs> so my regards from the Montserrat hospitals where we are ex executing uh, surgeries uh, to the entire team and to you, uh, Jack. So um, we are, uh, one must know that uh, we in 40, at least 40, perhaps between 40 and 50% of our uh, coronary revascularization patients in our surgical cohort are diabetics. So this is something we encounter very, very often. And how is that, does this make our job more difficult or different? Is, you of, of course see more diffuse disease earlier in life, younger patients, and uh, very difficult to target to revascularize. That's, that's from the surgical perspective. Other than that, I mean, we follow the same guidelines. Uh, and uh, uh, we're inclined to uh, have a more urgent attitude in diabetic patients because of their lack of symptomatology and pain sometimes. So um, I don't know uh, if I could contribute actively to the stenting discussion, but uh, perhaps I have a question to our uh, esteemed speaker uh, and congratulate him for his very, very nice uh, and insightful lecture. Uh, how do you deal or how often do you deal with uh, patients post cabbage coronary artery revascularization uh, who come to you, diabetics, for reopening of bypasses or progression of native disease? We have quite a few of those as well. Yeah, it, it certainly um, is an issue that, that comes up and um... As you say, not infrequently, and, and I guess often earlier than in non-diabetics as well. 
um, with that more rapid progression and, and more diffuse disease. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon um, in my practice to, to then perform PCI after bypass surgery, um, you know, either through the bypass graft or, or sometimes the native vessel. And, and I guess in my experience, and I'd open it to, to other panelists as well, um, it's not necessarily graft failure, it's progression of the, the native disease quite often. So you find that you're stenting distal to the, the anastomoses um, or, you know, opening up a, a more proximal branch that was previously supplied by the graft um, that there's been progression in, in, that, in that region. So you might be opening up the, the native vessels to, to an obtuse marginal or, or diagonal or something like that. And you're, you're right. And, and I guess uh, with, without having a lot of data in my talk, I certainly alluded to the fact that it's an issue for, for both you know, surgeons and, and interventions alike in terms of that more rapid disease progression. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And it has an impact on our surgical approach. I mean, there are certain things we can do. Um, uh, you know, uh, we have quite a, an armamentarium of surgical techniques such as beating heart, off pump, uh, CPB, uh, you know, heart lung machine supported, supported that is, or less invasive procedures. And um, well, uh, in diabetic patients, you may not have everything at hand given the diffuse nature of the disease. But if I may be allowed to make a prediction before I go back to the operation here in the theater next door, um, I, would, I would love to have your insight in, in the future of coronary vascularization, particularly in those patients, meaning we tend to promote less invasive techniques. And um, there is a trend towards hybrid re uh, revascularization now. So if I were to be asked, what's the optimal coronary vascularization method, particularly in diabetics in the future, I would say hybrid, where a surgeon goes in from the for the culprit lesion and um, same stop or two stage leaves the non-culprit lesion to the cardiologist, all subject to discussion and guidelines as they arise in future. Uh, is Thanks, there any... Uh... Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah. uh, maybe I can just redirect that question to Raj uh, from uh, Brunei then. Although we talk about hybrid a lot, we know that the lima is great. The rest, maybe the stents might help perform a venous graph, but currently it's not being adopted in a big way. Um, Raj, uh, do you have a comment to that? I agree. Um, thank you. Thank. It's great. It's great to have a surgeon on the panel. I must say, it's nice to have. There are points we can discuss which we can't discuss otherwise. So, so Prof. Coffee, this is very nice to have you here. Um, Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, it is something we do anecdotally at present. Um, it's certainly in my center quite frequently. Even as recently as yesterday morning, we have patients with a skimmy. Um, who come in with a severe three vessel or left main disease where we do angioplasty just to the culprit artery. And we try and make an effort not to put in a skin whenever possible. We just do a POBA and a DEB. Although sometimes a DEB is not really required uh, with the idea that CABG is done as an inpatient. Uh, the surgeons normally like to wait for about a week for the myocardium to heal and they are quite happy to operate about a week later, uh, by which time they do stop the ticagrelor or, or a Plavix for about uh, you know, 20, 48 hours or something like that. And because there is no skin inside, they go ahead and operate. So we have done this successfully. In, in fact, my fellow was just writing up the data, which we hope to present or publish uh, for about three years. So it happens to an extent. Uh, in, you know, in patients who have to have the culprit vessel rebast, uh, you know, reperfusion achieved, and then, but, you know, a, a multi-vessel skinting is avoided, and they have CABG, and we place a lot of importance on having a lima to the LAD. A lot of these patients are diabetic, and in the long term, we know that a lima to the LAD is better than having three scans there. Outside um, the context of MI, it is infrequent. If you send skimmy, they have multivessel disease, uh, left multivessel disease. We just go for a full fledged uh, CABG. Very infrequent. Uh, that's sort of what we do. 
um, in terms of, you know, you asked to predict the future, what is going to be a combination of uh, CABG and uh, PCI? I think where PCI is progressing is uh, with better scans. And I think DEB is good or bioresolvable scaffolds could be very good because the one place where, you know, where we cannot beat CABG is diffuse LAD disease. You know, a lima, and you know, putting in three scans is never going to be as good as having a lima there for 10, 15 years. Uh, whereas, I think if we were able to use, a, you know, if it, one, if and when we get a really good BRS, and now I think DEBs are pretty good as well. And uh, in combination with um, good techniques like cutting balloons and things, if we can achieve good re uh, PCI in the distal LAD without putting in metal scaffolding, I think that could make a difference. And, uh, you know, in fact, I was just saying in a different meeting, uh, we, we have a patient, uh, I mean, we, we do a couple of patients who have been turned down for CABG, young patients, but no good target for Lima, diabetic patients, of course, uh, where we have done PCI with uh, cutting balloon and DEB, no skint, and the LED looks pretty good now. Of course, patients had multivessel PCI. Patient, uh, we did hybrid, we did skins in the proximal LAD. I wonder, and, and I presented this case to you, I mean, uh, submitted a Euro PCR, saying that we have actually created a target for a Lima here. If in the future it happens that the patient develops in skin re skinosis in the proximal vessel in the skin, and no re you know, if the distal vessel is patent, she could potentially have a Lima because there are no skins in the distal LAD. And, uh, you know, and those are the ideas I can think of how CABG and PCI could combine in the future. Thanks, uh, Raja. Very difficult to ask you to predict the future. I have lots of other questions, but to maybe contextualize the questions, we'll go back to the CAF lab now. We'll use the case to talk about what is most appropriate in terms of strategy and revascularization for the patient. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, CAF lab, can we uh, just zone in to the CAF lab now? Uh, Yen San, can you share from the CAF lab? Going to put a three five ten. Uh, yeah, uh, Sutek, we can hear you now. Wait, so we're coming. Whether it's three five or not. Hi guys, Hi guys. Uh, Sutek uh, and uh, Aaron, we are hearing your feedback from your speaker, but uh, saying hello to you. Um, hey, hello, we are now Jack. live in the cafe lab. Hi, hi, hi. I, I, hi hello, Jack and uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm Sutek here. Yeah, uh, with me is my uh, good friend for many, many years. Uh, yeah, fellow sufferer of the Society of the Depressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Aaron Wong, uh, Professor Aaron Wong. Yeah, we prepared Thanks. a very nice case today. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, uh, Aaron will go through the history and then show the NGO and the um, the, the, uh, Professor Chin will show the, the IVERS and then after that we can have a brief discussion yeah, and okay. uh, enjoy this case. I think it's a very educational case. Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Jack and uh, panelists. Uh, we have an 81-year-old uh, 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 lady of uh, risk factors of uh, diabetes, hypertension, hypertension, and had uh, 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 breast CA had mastectomy done uh, around the same time, 2012, and presented just recently last month with an unstable angina. And Kath showed that there's triple vessel disease and uh, we discussed about bypass uh, for her, but in view of age, um, so she declined. And then uh, we uh, treat the, the um, uh, RCA uh, a few days ago, a week ago, a week plus ago to the RPD. And then um, uh, this time we come back to do the, uh, 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 the, the left side. Um, the, Laboratory results uh, is really unremarkable. Um, the creatinine and HP are all, all quite normal. Can you show the ECG? Next slides. Yeah, the ECG. Actually, uh, the, this is a presenting ECG show that the T wave inversion in the anterior leaks, maybe the, um, the, the culprit could be on the left side, but um, I think um, it's safer probably to do the right side uh, before we proceed to the left main. And next, can we see the angiogram? Or maybe we show the today's angiogram. Uh, show the uh -huh. right side, right side. They may have the right side, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is a diagnostic angiogram done. And then the, that's the right coronary artery. Uh, there's a, quite a, a discrete RCA lesion and it was treated. 
uh, about uh, 10 days ago. Yeah, show the left side. Yep, uh, um, I can't see this angel, but anyway, you, you see a, 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 a circumflex, very long diffuse disease, uh, osteocirc, as well as osteo um, LED. The spider view will show very well. And we can show you the angiogram today. Yeah. Maybe. It's so, Aaron, I'm just finishing up the rest of the angel uh, for the LED, just for the audience and the panelists to have a quick look at it first. So, I think that today's target that uh, Aaron is going to demonstrate to us is this 81 years old diabetic patient with ACS, left main triple vessel disease, uh, really quite high syntax score as well. So um, um, maybe you'd like to share us today's angel? Yep. Okay, so can you see the angiogram, uh, the spider view and areocranial view? Maybe just see the spider view first. You can see the, uh, the left main uh, bifurcation, both branches are ostium is severely diseased. Uh, it's a left main equivalent. And the areocranial view, you can see some, there's some classification in the distal left main and also in the proximal LAD. Um, I'm not sure whether you can see well on the uh, on the uh, uh, on your screen. So next view is the AP chordal and LEO cranial view. Yep, sorry. <laughs> yep. As you can see, the cirque is quite a long and uh, diffuse disease with the OM branch, and then the LEO cranial view also show that it's a very calcified uh, lesion, as you can see uh, on the on the LEO cranial view. The left main relatively uh, healthy, there's a bent uh, uh, at the, uh, the ostium. So, um, so what will you just show you the um, what we did up to the ivers mm -hmm. and then let you guys discuss. The ivers uh, went down quite easily to the cert. We both wire both, yeah, not, not difficult to wire. And then, uh, Chi Yang, uh, can you present the ivers finding, please? Yeah, okay. So, I see we've switched to ivers. So, this is the first um, ivers run from the cert. I'll start from the left main. Uh, going distally. So here we are in the guide catheter. Here is in the uh, um, very proximal part of the left main. You can see the left main is large and at this point fairly healthy. As we move towards the distal left main, you start to see a little bit of plaque, some superficial calcium, not too much. As we keep going distally, it gets a bit tighter. So this is at the distal left main. There's a, a fairly eccentric uh, uh, plaque and this is um, going into the circ now. So we are on, we are on the uh, circ wire. So here at 11 o'clock, that branch with the wire going in is the LAD. So here's the circ ostium. You can see it's, it's tight. Um, there is a fibrocalcific plaque uh, almost circumferentially uh, in this segment. More proximally in the circ, again, uh, some calcium, not too much. Here's mostly fibrous plaque. The lumen is not too bad at this point. Um, but you can see on and off as we go down into the uh, uh, mid-circumflex, there is uh, uh, intermittent um, areas where there is quite a bit of plaque burden, uh, mostly fibrous at this point. There's a bit of um, almost concentric uh, calcification here, but not too bad and, and, and not too long. Here we're going uh, further distal in the circ. Again, some uh, mo mostly fibrous uh, disease. And here is in the OM branch, um, the distal uh, healthy segment. So in summary for the CERC, uh, mostly fibrous, a little bit of uh, calcium, uh, but not too bad. Um, and uh, 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 yeah, quite, quite a long lesion. Uh, so probably need two stents, uh, one inside the CERC and then uh, another one from CERC to left main. I'll go ahead and show you the pullback from the LAD. So this is the second run from the LAD. Again, I'll start proximally here if we're in the guide catheter moving, uh, this, uh, moving distally. So two wires at this point here, we're on the LAD wire. As we go down the uh, uh, left main bifurcation here at three o'clock, that's the circumflex. This is the ostium of the LED. You can see it's tight. There is some uh, eccentric calcification on the opposite uh, wall to the carina. Moving more uh, distally again, we get to some areas where there's really quite a, a lot of calcification. So here it's concentric calcification. There's a lot of reverberation behind it. If we use the IVUS calcium score, uh, this will score very highly on that. So just as a reminder, IVUS calcium score can predict uh, whether or not we're likely to run into trouble with stent expansion. Um, the main element of the uh, uh, IVUS score is whether you have concentric, concentric calcification or not. So if you have any area of uh, calcification of more than 270 degrees, 
Um, and if it's uh, for a length of more than five millimeters, you score a point. If you get 360 um, degree uh, calcification, you get another point. If you have any evidence of a calcified nodule, which we do not in this case, you get an extra point. So we don't get a point for that one. And then uh, finally, if your uh, vessel size is less than 3.5 millimeters in diameter um, uh, near the area of calcification, uh, which it is in our case, then you get an extra point. So we get about three points out of the four. And that uh, predicts that uh, we're, we, we might run into problems with uh, stent expansion. Um, and so uh, we need to have a proper uh, uh, lesion preparation. So in summary for the LAD, uh, also a fairly uh, diffuse kind of lesion, a lot more calcium seen in the LAD compared to the uh, circumflex. Um, and again, probably need a two stent technique here, one in the LAD itself, and then the other one from left main to LAD. Thanks. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. so Be before you jump so, in, uh, Aaron, uh, maybe I can get some comments from the panelists first. Um, uh, we have an 81 years old diabetic lady, declined surgery, already done the PDA and the RCA. Dr. Hung uh, from uh, uh, Vietnam, having seen the IVUS now, does that affect your strategy or intervention? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, Dr. Professor Lim Sutek and Dr. Aaron Wong in the CAT lab. And uh, at the, I looked at the uh, uh, angel and then the IVUS. So I think that the, it is a very uh, good uh, candidate for the BCI because the patient is 81 years years old already. So this visa is indicated. So um, based on the IVERS, I think that the, uh, I think the, uh, uh, we have to repair the lesion in the LED. And the, uh, we, I do the uh, provisional sending for the left man to the LED and just the stand uh, at the focal lesion in the circumflex uh, without any uh, two stand at the bifurcation. I uh, keep stay away from the bifurcation of left man. So, the focal stand in the LED, in the circumflex and the uh, stand to the left man to LED, uh, and uh, my, I use the uh, gel balloon for the to protect the osteum of the circumflex as well. And uh, maybe we use the rotor blade, uh, rotor blade, or we use the cutting balloon. It's up to the uh, uh, operator. Uh, operator. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hung. So Dr. Hung is going to keep it quite simple. TK, um, how about you? Uh, is this going to be really a strategy as well? Um, more or less the same. I mean, there's a fair bit of calcification. So obviously the lesion, especially the LED, needs a fair bit of preparation, good lesion preparation. And that will mean some form of decalcification or debulking, um, probably a rota, I think. Um, and uh, and I would finish, uh, I would, and you would probably need to use other scoring or cutting balloons in both the LED as well as the circumflex uh, for the preparation. And I think after the lesions preparation, I'll reassess again, um, maybe with imaging to decide the next step, whether to do full metal, I mean, lots of metals or a hybrid of metal plus drug coated balloons. Thanks, uh, TK. So a uh, uh, pause for reassessment, whatever strategy you use. Well, William, uh, she's 81. She's likely gonna become high breathing risk anytime. And uh, what, what would be your plans if you take that into consideration as well on top of the diabetes. Yeah, thanks, Jack. So again, um, imaging to optimize the stent uh, deployment. So I'll choose a stent with some high bleeding risk data uh, for this patient, because she's, uh, as you mentioned, high bleeding risk. Uh, I'll go with actually a two cent strategy, maybe a DK crush, and maybe with a short wave uh, intra vascular lithotripsy to keep it simple. Yeah, thanks, William. Uh, Jimmy, you saw the IVERS. Uh, anything else you'd like to add on to the tips and tricks for this patient beyond what Chi Yang said? Thank you, Jack. So I think the IVERS was very useful uh, to assess the calcium burden and to assess the lumen of the osteum lesion. I noticed that the left mean actually look, the caliber of the left mean actually looks big relative to the LED. So the IVERS actually helps to size the vessel very well here. Looking at the calcium burden, actually most of it appears to be more superficial. So potentially it may expand well with a scoring or a cutting balloons. Yeah. So one may consider rotablation, but if you want to rotablate across the circumflex, potentially higher risk, there's also risk of a perforation as well. So I think um, perhaps one can consider a trial of uh, cutting or scoring balloons first and then assess the lumen expansion using IVERS. Thanks, uh, Jiming. So we, we are quite aligned, actually. Steve, uh, you gave the lecture on tips and tricks. Any last comments to add on before we go to the operators? 
probably nothing additional, but, but I agree with um, you know the last speaker. You know, trying initially, uh, you know, with your balloons and scoring balloons and things, and, and seeing if you are getting adequate expansion. Because although that, that calcium was there, um, it was relatively superficial. So, uh, uh, Aaron, we're back to you in the cath lab. Uh, we get you unmuted first. Looks like most of my panelists want to keep this simple for this 81 year so lady, likely a bifurcation setting. Yeah, we, we, likely we, we no... think likewise too. We think likewise <laughs> too. And we want to make it even simpler. But I think one of the most important lessons is the, the importance of the intracoronary imaging in uh, helping with the strategy. Yeah. Yeah, if we just look at the angio, uh, the, the degree of calcification is a bit difficult to be uh, determined. Uh, yeah, once we have the IVUS going easily with that type of plug characteristic, the calcified plug distribution, yeah, and uh, things become uh, uh, easier to decide. Uh, Aaron, uh, so maybe Aaron will show what has been done. Yeah. Yeah. So when we put the IVUS down in the uh, LED, it was a very a lot, a lot of resistant. Uh, as you can see, the you see the buckling here of the uh, Ivers catheter here, but eventually we managed to go down LED. So what we did is um we we treat the uh, circ first. This is a two five uh, NC balloon. Um, uh, this is this uh, Look, it uh, the balloon dilate quite well actually. I think consistent with the uh, finding of the Ivers that there is no no significant uh, calcification. Um, so this is the uh, Pre-dilatation of a circ. This is the after angio. We reposition the wire, and uh, we decide to stent um, the uh, circ with a two five. Uh, uh, what the twenty six is right? Two five. Uh, thirty. 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 Five thirty. 30. Yeah, two five thirty. 30. And as you can see, it goes down very, uh, very smoothly. And uh, the, although the vessel is three O, but uh, this stent can easily be expanded uh, much more than uh, uh, two five. Yeah. So um, this, uh, we, this is positioning, uh, we deployed and expand pretty well. And then we uh, pre-dilate the proximal lesion as well. And then post-dilate with the 3 NC balloon. Again, expand quite well. The lumen looks to be pretty okay. So we use this to measure the length of the stent, although with Ivers, but the, are we a bit lazy. <laughs> no, no, we did. We, we did. We, we, we did use Ivers. So we decided uh, whether it's uh, oh, 18 or 22. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, we use Ivers to, to guide us. So we decide to, uh, before we do the crush, we um, uh, we have to make sure that um, the LED um, uh, uh, lesion can be properly expanded because if we need to rotablation, then we may have to lose the wire uh, of the circ, actually. So um, I can see the balloon actually slip when we when we um, inflate, so meaning that there's a very tight uh, lesion in the LED. So uh, we dilated here, and then balloon burst actually, uh, when we pull back uh, to dilate, I think, this, you record it down? Yeah, yeah, here you go, yeah. See here, the moment it inflate, it bursts. Um, is that the place for the concentric calcium right near the ostium? Yeah, yeah. You see that waste there. That is where the I was show the concentric uh, calcification. And Tiang say it run for how many millimeters? Tiang the length. Uh, in, in this case, for about eight eight millimeter. Eight, eight millimeter is more than a five millimeter yeah. concentric. Yeah. And you see the a, a large dissection there on the LED, and um, so and then we use another new balloon. As you can see, there is a very very tight calcium, uh, uh, concentric calcium there. We couldn't expand it with the 2.5 NC balloon. So um, any um, uh, suggestion from the panel? So um, I think it was very nicely demonstrated. Actually the intravascular imaging, although it could cross, clearly showed the segment of high risk concentric calcification. Superficial as it may, it didn't quite open up and cause a balloon rupture. So uh, perhaps at this juncture now, uh, I would like to uh, go back to TK. Uh, what transition will you do at this moment? Well, you will have to do something about the calcium and the LED first, right? Otherwise, it's going to be stuck. Uh, um, the problem is, uh, what what do we do? How 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 do we go about doing that? And uh, since the patient has, uh, you, you don't want to lose the balloon, the wire, and the second flex, 
There's more suggestion earlier about using uh, IVL might be a, a good one, right? Then you can maintain the wire in the second so, place. But if you have to go for rotablation, of course, you have to remove that wire and lose um, um, risk, lose, losing access to the second flex. So Aaron, uh, PK suggests just IVL it. Um, now that you got a waste, uh, I don't know whether you agree with that or not. Uh, any other opinion? Rotablation? Oh yeah, Dr. Hung also previously suggested uh, some form of attracting me IV or rotablation. Yeah, Will yeah. you rotablate now, Dr. Hung? Yeah, I think that uh, you haven't used the uh, cutting balloon or scoring balloon, so I, I think that the 81 years, uh, years old uh, lady, yeah. so I think that keep it simple yeah. and in yeah. some situation, I switch to the rotablation, uh, rotablation I use the micro catheter and then you switch to the uh, rot uh, rotor wire and then rotablate, but it is quite dangerous for the uh, after already uh, ballooning and cause a, a lot of side section, not in mind the last choice. Thank you. Thanks for the room. Chi Ming, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I think so far this is just a non-compliant balloon. So probably to try a cutting or scoring balloon first, since there's quite a great deal of dissections in the proximal LED already. You do rotablation, it's increased risk of extra vastation. Professor Yang, uh, if you can, if you are there, do you have any comments at this juncture as well? If you're, you can switch on your camera if possible. Uh, yeah, I switched on. Camera is on now, maybe just because of the delay of the transition. Yeah. Yeah. I quite agree with um, with uh, Dr. Hong and Dr. Jiaming that uh, we, we might try the cutting balloon first and we were to see whether we can, uh, the outcome, the imaging color of this, um, yeah. I will try the cutting balloon first. So uh, Aaron and uh, Sutek, everyone says, try not to rotoblade, uh, try harder with a cutting balloon, maybe OPM balloon. Uh, what, what have you guys decided to do? Okay, so um, uh, we go for the- uh, The uh, OPM, we go for the OPM. Yeah, uh, sim simpler. Lah. We, we, uh, uh, so we, uh, this is the uh, OPM, I think, we, I've seen it. Uh, is this this is how many yeah. MSPs? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So wow, there okay. is between the 20 to 25 atmospheric pressure with the OPM balloon. Yeah. And this is how what size OPM? 2.5. 2.5. Okay. And uh, okay. looks yeah, very nice. Maybe, it yeah, after it pops, huh? after it pops, I think maybe we can show the Ivers. There is this satisfaction of looking at the cracked calcium. Like <laughs> Chia. Chia. <laughs> Let, let's see the Ivers. Yeah. So, uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, we're yeah, seeing you now, Chia. Yeah. yeah as, you, as you might remember, uh, it was uh, mostly concentric there, right? Uh, so, I'll show you go straight to where the balloon expanded. So, you can see here, you can see cracks now in the calcium. Is there one more, more. block? Uh, again, down here about five o'clock. So, so here, cracks in uh, multiple uh, uh, planes, if you like. So that's that's always nice to see. Don't know yeah. what we have so yeah, so so the, the the calcium has definitely been uh, uh, disrupted by the uh, the balloon, and uh, uh, as uh, <laughs> Doctor Lin said, it's always quite satisfying to see all these uh, cracks because sometimes you don't see them, right? Uh, so when you do see them, then you then you can be fairly confident that um. Uh, you, you should be able to achieve reasonable expansion in that area. Dr. Young, uh, you saw the cracks on Ivers, you saw the balloon go up. Is there a need to go further with a larger balloon here or this is good enough on Ivers as well? Dr. Young? Mm, yeah. If you can unmute yourself, Dr. Young. It is not good anymore. Um, yes, I, I don't think we need a further bigger balloon i think because the, the classification is already already distracted i think enough so um look, looks like we're quite happy as well and uh uh so take aaron what, what what is your strategy now i you you're okay, telling so us you're gonna do two stands in the left main right and how are you gonna do that yeah so we discussed actually with uh so take before the case uh um, I, I, for the left main, I more preferred um, uh, DK crush uh, um, for a few reasons. Um, uh, but uh, Sute actually um, quite favored a DK culotte. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we just need double keys. 
no? double keys. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we uh, after that uh, we did iverse for both arteries, and then we uh, decided to stand the LED first because there's a dissection there. We don't want the the um, hematoma to uh, progress while waiting for the uh, to go live. So this is a two five. Uh, two five thirty. No, 26. 26, yeah. 26, yeah. yeah. Uh, onyx, yeah. 25. So this is positioning deployed. It's very nicely expanded. Um, yeah, and then we post it with the 3.0 uh, uh, NC balloon. This is one small trick when uh, you are, uh, the wire is, uh, is, is tangled. So we just inflate the balloon uh, very gently to separate the wire and then just gently push the balloon down. And... Uh, um, Obviously, this is to, to, to save a balloon uh, because you can use always use a new balloon to go down. But uh, this is one trick to uh, push the uh, uh, use uh, the inflated balloon down. Yeah. So we post dilated. And uh, yeah, this is how uh, it looks like. The wire. So we, we, we will um, plan to do a, a, a what we call a, a decay crash. So uh, we uh, size it with the 3022 uh, in the Sir, I run DK uh, Q-Lot or DK Crush in the end. I still can't. DK Crush. Not, DK Crush, okay. DK Crush, yeah, yeah. So this is a balloon uh, in, a, in the LED. So we position it and uh, we uh, dilate it. Explain quite well. At this point, some may uh, use uh, take out this balloon and put an NC balloon to open up the stand slot a bit better. but. Looking at this uh, angiogram, it looks like it's, it's quite well expanded. La. So we, we, we skip that step uh, for our NC balloon. Yeah? Um, and then we use a trio to crush the, uh, the stand. Obviously, it's not big enough. So after that, we use a 4-0 NC balloon to, uh, to crush the, um, the stand. So that's where we are now. Um, uh, we try to do the first kiss, but the wire looks a bit damaged. So, uh, yeah. so we're going to... Uh, um, uh, use a new wire, and then and then the panelists can discuss. Uh, uh, also, they can dis discuss what's the uh, 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 opinion on this strategy. Yeah, the, the, there may be a variation of the step. Huh? Some people believe that uh, the third wire uh, in place while crushing it, uh, using it as a as a landmark. Hmm? Yeah. So you withdraw the wire in the third to recross. Is that right, today? Sorry. You pull out the wire in the third ring, is that right? Uh, we, we will yeah, the yeah, wire uh, we pull out. Yeah. yeah, some will leave the wire, leave it in as a landmark. Yeah, landmark, and, and then, uh, yeah. So, so Raj, guide, uh, because, because the entry, the crossing uh, the, the, for the first case is towards the proximal part of the this crush stand so that we don't get too distally. Uh, there, there may be a space uh, near to the distal end. Raj, so, um, would you use this strategy as well for the left main? Very much, yeah. No, it's my favorite go-to technique, DK crush for left main bifurcation. And it's uh, in this, uh, anyone else with a different opinion? Uh, Dr. Hung? Uh, yes, the, this is quite <laughs> complex for this patient already because we, we deal with the, we're dealing with the two stand technique already. But in this situation, I think we can uh, put the wire in position and then we keep that for rewiring as Dr. Sutek already mentioned about. So in this situation, uh, you pull out the wire and then uh, it's quite hard to know that this is the proximal or to the make of the ultimate of the circumflex because we want to rewire into the proximal part, not this door. Is this correct? Yeah, Dr. Hung, that's right. Uh, more proximal or mid, not distal for DK crush. Uh, TK, yeah. do you pull the wire actually usually or you leave the wire there as well? Uh, usually I leave the wire there, use a, another wire, just using as a, as a landmark, yeah, as uh, Sutek mentioned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I think, think most I think, of I us... If... Sorry, TK, go ahead. Uh, but, but I think if your stand is highly visible, um, maybe it's not necessary, yeah. Yeah, I, I think most of us probably more comfortable just parking the wire there anyway. It's not a uh, threat. And as a landmark, uh, maybe easier to see where exactly it is. And in that crush state, the wire will be biased towards the more distal strut. So you can use that as a guide to wire more proximally. Um, William, do you have any other tips and tricks in the left-hand bifurcation here? No, I've done the same. I've left the wire to guide 
um, the entry side to be more proximal. That's what you mentioned. So, uh, Sutek and Aaron, do you have any last comments? Uh, if not, we'll drop off to the second lecture. Hey, Sutek? Jack, Jack, we, before that, before leaving, uh, maybe for those who, who want to leave the wire inside the circle, right? You will use the new wire, the third wire, to uh, recross the stand, or you get the LED wire. That's a good so question. What, what uh, is we'll a ask, user uh, practice? Yeah. We'll ask Raj uh, to comment and ask his uh, questions yeah, as well. Chill. Yeah, Raj. Chill. All right, thanks. Uh, no, I use a fresh wire uh, because I think when we have to cross distally with different techniques like culotte, when we have to go through the distal last uh, stride, I think it's nice to pull an existing wire and cross, you know, as we slip into the distal strut. But uh, like Prof. Lim said, uh, in this, in the DK crush, we have to go through the proximal marker. So we need to come in from the catheter anyway. I do not like leaving my uh, wire inside the circ stent. Uh, I take it out before I crush. Uh, and, and also anything bad happens. That's just my practice. I prefer to have it outside and I get a, a new wire in and uh, go in. The only other thing I was going to suggest sometimes, and I, because she's 81 years old, and you know, um, I would definitely treat the circ because it's a three millimeter vessel, heavily diseased. Um, uh, DEB uh, may have something, something I would have considered uh, in the uh, circumflex, you know, stent the distal vessel to avoid a bifurcation stent in this 81 year old. Uh, once we got good, uh, you know, expansion, a cutting balloon and a DEB, and then just a provisional stent. If it didn't work, then we could have put, uh, then I would have put in a second, you know, maybe a tap or something. Uh, just given the age and the bleeding risk, something I may have considered. Thanks, uh, Raj. Dr. Hung, you have a comment to make here? Uh, uh, yes, I uh, uh, totally agree with Dr. Raj about the keep the wire in position in LED lab man. Because this is the advantage of the uh, the K cross, the mini cross, any any anything like this, because it is the main wire. So keep in that in position. In case we we uh, accidentally lost uh, lose the wire, otherwise the wire is still positioned from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Uh, Timmy, you have a last comment. Yeah, thanks, Jack. I used to leave the jail wire in the complex, but I encounter instances in which there is significant uh, wire wrap around the jet wire. So sometimes I'll leave the leaf jet wire first, but if I have difficulty uh, crossing, I might remove the jet wire and then recross using a new wire. I, I never leave the, I never take out the LED wire at all for DK crush. Because there's always the risk that you have difficulty rewriting the LED and you get stuck. Does that answer your question, uh, Sutek? Maybe you can get unmuted. Yeah, Sutek? Uh, yeah, sorry. Does it answer your question? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think we just, yeah, I, I, I fully agree with all the ex, uh, expert opinion. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the LED here, we, uh, we try not to lose the wire. Mm, yeah, I think, uh, so I think the, the reason Aaron pulled the third wire out is actually want to save some cost, save one wire cost. Uh, so, because, uh, uh, think, yeah. <laughs> maybe I can ask uh, uh, Sutek or Aaron to take this one. Uh, attendee actually asked, you know, also very concerned about high bleeding risk. Patient is 81 years old, high bleeding risk. With this DK crush technique that you're doing with lots of metal already implanted, how long would the DAPT be with this second generation Onyx stent? And do you have data to support your uh, guidance, uh, Sutek? Yeah, this one, uh, if the patient can tolerate it very well, uh, I will leave at least... Uh, three to six months. Uh, yeah, it, it's in the left main. Uh, it's critical, a lot of matter, and uh, um, preferably at least six months. Uh, yeah. Uh, Aaron, you, the, yeah. the duration of the DAPT? Yeah, I think uh, the good thing about this Onyx is because you have indication for one month. So if anything happening, even at one month, we are sort of confident that uh, it can continue on single anti platelets. Yeah. So for this case, I would, uh, 80, although it's uh, 81 years old, but the, the, it doesn't fit the high bleeding rate criteria, it only fit the, the age actually. The rest are actually, you know, didn't meet the major criteria, yeah. only one minor. So I think we we'll probably continue for at least six months for me. Yeah. Uh, Jack, Jack, you have any other difference, duration, uh, recommendation? I think the patient initially presented with uh, unstable angina or ACS. So that is another consideration, but it looks like after this is almost fully revascularized. So although it fulfills only a minor criteria in up bleeding consensus or more than 75 years old, 
I'll still be very cautious. Uh. So, so I think uh, anywhere between okay, three to six, come. I would say based on the intervention that you're doing, I will still do at least six months if, if you ask me. Uh, and if, if it's okay with you, uh, Aaron and Sutek, we're going to uh, transit now to TK's lecture. It, your case looks very fascinating now, but we need to give some time for TK to sure. deliver his lecture. Yeah. When we come back, we'll show the final result. Okay. So, uh, TK, do you mind sharing your lecture? Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> I was asked, uh, you know, to give a talk about, you know, making sense of guidelines and trials, clearing the confusion. Uh, I was a bit confused by this title. And uh, I mean, it start, looks like such a wide topic and I'm not quite sure uh, what I'm supposed to talk about. So uh, I can't be very sure that I've cleared my own confusion. Uh, nevertheless, um, since I've been given only 15 minutes uh, to give this talk, I will concentrate on just one guideline and, uh, and one trial. And the guideline that I'm going to talk about is uh, the European guidelines for myocardial revascularization, uh, zooming in in particular on their recommendations for diabetic patients. If you look at this table, you can see that by and large, bypass surgery is the recommended mode of revascularization for diabetic patients, because we know that diabetic patients usually have diffuse triple vessel disease. There is, however, of course, a role for PCI uh, in selected left main disease where the syntax score is low. And in those patients who are diabetic, but who happen to have only one or two vessel disease. However, you will note that even in those patients with one or two vessel disease, uh, bypass surgery is also a reasonable option for those patients. The Europeans have made those recommendations based on the data of randomized clinical trials, which include trials such as Freedom, the Veteran Affairs Studies, Cardia, Syntax, the BEST trial, or rather the uh, diabetic subgroup in the BEST trial, as well as uh, meta-analysis and uh, population-based analysis, which led the writing committee to conclude that overall, the current evidence continues to favor bypass surgery as a revascularization modality of choice for patients with diabetes and multivessel disease. But that is where the problem is, you know, with guidelines because guidelines are guidelines and they are often based on randomized control trials. And we all know that in a randomized control trial setting, patients receive their revascularization in a timely fashion. For instance, in the best trial, in which our center also participated in, after the diagnostic angiogram, the patient is then randomized to either multi-vessel PCI or bypass surgery, and the revascularization has to be done within one month of the angiogram. To have the bypass surgery with one angiogram, I think is achievable, easily achievable in a country like Singapore or Australia or New Zealand. But I can tell you, that in many other countries in the Asia Pacific region, that is not possible. In fact, in my own institution, the waiting list for elective bypass surgery is more than one year. And we know that waiting for bypass surgery is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. This is a study that came from the Netherlands, where they look at the patients who, are, um, who underwent surgery either on a routine list or as an urgent procedure. An urgent meaning within six weeks, and that is because the patient either has left main or triple vessel disease with symptoms, or just a normal routine, uh, you know. But here you will notice that even routine, when I talk about routine, it's surgery that's done within three months. As I mentioned earlier, not achievable in many of the poorer resourced countries in the Asia Pacific region. And we can see from their study that as you wait for surgery, events happen. Of course, in those patients, the urgent risk, they have more events. And this is because of the characteristics of those patients, they are higher risk patients. But whether it doesn't matter whether in a routine list or the urgent risk, you can see that most of the events occur in the first 30 days. 
after the diagnostic angiogram. And therefore, early timely surgery is important, but that is, again, not possible in many places. So during our regular, in my center, my regular meetings, hard team meetings, we often have you know, weekly hard team discussions. I often tell my surgeons that a patient can benefit from bypass surgery only if he or she actually undergoes that surgery. So if PCI then remains the only viable option for the patient, either by choice, because the patient does not want surgery, or whether by circumstance, then we have to decide what is the best PCI strategy for diabetic patients? Should we use drug eluting stents or should we use drug coated balloons? And if we choose a drug eluting stent strategy, which stent is the best? Are there any differences between the stents? Is one better than the other? So that then brings us to the trial, the study called sugar. Is it as sweet as it sounds? Not all of us, know, uh, most of us probably are familiar with sugar, but for those of us who are not, this is an investigator initiated trial done in um, multiple centers in Europe where patients who have diabetes and undergo uh, PCI or then um, screened and see whether they are suitable for this study or not. You can see that during the period of the study, nearly 3,500 patients, diabetic patients, underwent uh, PCI in the investigating sites. But of this, only slightly over 1,000 was eventually um, uh, randomized right, into the study. And so you have about 580 in each group. One group receives the create EVO stents during the PCI, and the other group receives the resolute onyx stents. And these are a summary of the results. The primary endpoint was to demonstrate non inferiority of the create evil stent to the resolute onyx stent at one year. All right, non inferiority. Uh, and the non inferiority was for the end com uh, composite endpoint of target vision failure. The components of TLF then were cardiac death, cardiac vessel MI, and cardiac lesion revascularization. The outcomes you can see here. There was also an exploratory analysis to see whether there was a trend of possible superiority at one year. So the conclusion of the investigators, and this is from their publication in the European Heart Journal, from the paper itself, the conclusion was that in patients with diabetes, the study has shown that create evil was non inferior to resolute onyx with regards to target vision failure composite outcome. And the next sentence is very important, and you have to look at it very carefully. An exploratory analysis for superiority, exploratory analysis at one year suggests, not confirm, uh, suggests that the create evil stent might be might be superior to resolute onyx with regards to the same outcome. Nevertheless, all right, this is interesting and it's thought provoking. Why does the create evil appear to perform better than the resolute onyx? And also, if you look at the target lesion failure, why is the resolute onyx TLF so high in this study? Almost 11%. When we look at other studies in, of diabetic patients, or of studies where they just look at the diabetic subgroups in those uh, population where the resolute onyx is compared with other stents. You can see that the onyx stent performed as well as other stents in diabetic patients, but not only that, but the same event of TLF was in the region of seven to eight percent. So what is peculiar about this sugar trial? Could it be um, well, first of all, we just look at the endpoints, right? As I mentioned earlier, the endpoint was the composite of TLF, but if you look at the individual components and as well as the secondary endpoints, it appears that the difference in the composite endpoint was driven. Well, it was, you know, the individual components did not reach uh, statistical significance in terms of difference, but except maybe for TL, target lesion revascularization, almost, right? Almost reached significant. So maybe that was the one which drove the difference. Why is that the case? 
Could it be because of the passion characteristics? Were they as equally matched as was thought? Certainly, there are more patients in the resolute onyx arm which had been emitted or were undergone PCI because of STEMI. And we know that patients, uh, PCI in the settings of STEMI of SES usually gives a poor outcome. Or could it be a problem of lesion characteristics? There were more patients in the resolute onyx um, were type C lesions. But one very interesting point or observation was that post dilatation was done a lot higher. There was a lot more post dilatation for the uh, create EVO stent as compared to the resolute onyx stent. In fact, uh, post dilatation rate of about 29% in the resolute onyx arm is pretty low, right? Because nowadays we tend to do more post dilatation. So very low post dilatation, uh, but a lot higher in the patients who receive a create evil stent. Why is that the case? Could it be because of a difference in the stent design? Well, let me illustrate uh, something to you, all right? Uh, so this is a patient uh, with a stent, a stent A that has been implanted in the left anterior descending artery, a long stent. And look, if you look at the final angiogram, it looks reasonable. However, if you zoom in on the stent, you can see that the outline of the vessel wall is irregular, isn't it? It's a bit corrugated and not smooth, not like a water pipe. The, stem, the same stent, stent A, is implanted in another patient, also in the LAD. And if you zoom in, you see the same pattern. The irregularities, the roughness of the outline of the uh, segment that was stented. On the other hand, you can have another stent like stent B. And in this patient, the stent B was deployed from the left main to the LAD, to the mid LAD. And if you zoom in, it looks a lot smoother. And the stem stent, stent B was uh, implanted in another patient in, from the proximal to mid RCA. And again, when you zoom in, you can see that unlike the stent A, um, the outline is a lot smoother with stent B. So you have stent A and stent B. And I'm sure in the cath lab, if you have to do that, almost or near final angiogram, and you're going to see an angiogram like stand there, you ask, you think, oh, I probably will need to do further post dilatation. You try to get as smooth a result as possible, all right? And, 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 and a lot of times I have to stop my fellows from doing it because I say it, it, you can do as many post dilatation as you like, you will never get the result of stand B. So which one is stand A? And which one is stand B? Stand A is create evil. And stand B is resolute onyx. So could I explain the difference in the post dilatation rate between the two groups? I don't know. I'm just postulating. I've just been mischievous. I don't know. You know, the sugar trial was presented by Dr. Rafael Romagura from Spain in TCT 2021. And following the presentation of that study, there was a press conference at TCT. And at the press conference, Dr. Romagura himself said that further follow up is needed. He went on to admit that the resolute on extent may hold a slight edge in terms of deliverability, particularly in calcified tortuous or long lesions. And he also informed that although it, people look, they look at superiority at one year that was exploratory, however, they did design the study for superiority. And that was superiority, but that was superiority at two years. That was a pre-specified core primary endpoint at two years, and the results will be presented at this year's TCT. So I guess by the end of this year, we will know for sure, right, whether the create stent is superior uh, to the resolute onyx stent. In the meantime, I guess the best uh, conclusion or summary was by our good friend, Dr. David Kanzari, who urged us to adopt a wait and see approach. Of course, we would like to have a stent that's dedicated, that's so good for diabetic patients. However, for a stent to claim to be that stent, there needs to be biologic plausibility. And at this point in time, that plausibility is supported but not proven by this current study. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, TK. That, that was indeed a very thought-provoking uh, lecture. And I, I like the way you quickly went through guidelines, which is just a guide, 
and contextualizing it to our Asian uh, needs and limitations. And also to just be frank about discussing the sugar trial, which is an important trial and uh, the limitation thereof. So now I'd like to open for discussion among my panelists. I think the, uh, the big question that I hear from this discussion is that, is there really one stand that's really better than the next stand in the realm of diabetic PCI? Or is it purely a technique in our current uh, uh, mode, like what is presented by Steve? So maybe I, I'll go around. Um, we'll go to Steve first. Uh, there's too many of these 10 trials going on and everyone is head to head in one realm or the other. Um, what is your read of the sugar trial and your preferred or if any stand for diabetic subset? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, certainly we know that you know, drug eluding stents are, you know, perform well. Uh, in terms of picking between them, obviously, you know, I agree it's, it's thought provoking data that they've presented, but um, I, I don't think that we've got strong enough data to, to pick one over the other at the moment. And, um, you know, uh, I tend sometimes to pick, you know, based on um, bleeding risk and shorter DAPT time and those sort of things. Um, but it'll be interesting to see whether we get more data in this space directly. Thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, Raj, um, how about you, your, your opinion on what is presented on the data in sugar? Uh, this fantastic analysis by Dr. Ong about the uh, post dilatation, especially. I learned a lot there. Um, I think um, to me, all second generation drug eluting strains are pretty equal when it comes to treating diabetes. Uh, where I expect uh, one of the reasons we like, to, uh, even I used to create quite a bit at one point, sort of an exciting option for diabetics. It was polymer free. And I thought that my, and from the amphilimus itself, that would make a difference. Uh, but, you know, uh, sort of that was for a short while. So the one area where I thought there might be uh, advantages, uh, polymer, uh, sorry, biodegradable polymer stains, such as uh, Synergy or Osiro. But I think the data doesn't support it. I think uh, those two, along with Yukon, they've all been, um, you know, subjected to five year, 10 year studies. And there is no advantage over normal drug eluting skins. Um, so I haven't seen any one skin standing out really for diabetes. And I thought all drug eluting skins a second generation drug related skins are equal. But I would, I did want to ask Dr. Ong what he thought about, uh, you know, whether it was an advantage for uh, biodegradable polymer skins in diabetes. Um, I must say the biodegradable, uh, or biodegradable polymer stands. Okay, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think the uh, hype behind the biodegradable uh, uh, platform um, unfortunately has not lived up to its uh, to our expectations. And a lot of the studies uh, comparing that with uh, uh, po uh, permanent polymer stands have shown equivalence, you know, at, at best. So I don't think they have any special properties. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, uh, TK. Uh, Dr. Hung, in Vietnam, do you have, what, what is your practice in diabetic patients in regards to PCI? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Actually, I I, uh, I I wanted to mention this uh, this question for uh, Doctor Steve uh, because he, he his uh, conclusion without mentioning about the stand just uh, mentioned about the uh, the technique and the uh, indication, but now is Doctor Ong already present about the stand. So I, actually, I love the sugar in uh, in my country. Uh, we use quite a lot of. Uh, the the create evil as well but the sugar trial coming out so uh, i actually i love the theory of the trial because the uh, we know that the uh, in the diabetic patient so usually the patient uh, the diabetic patient had the increase the leptin the leptin it make the uh, resistant to the uh, light uh, uh drug so it needs about 10 times with the normal compared with the normal patient so with the amphilimus uh, formulation uh, combined between the limers and the fat, fatty uh, acids, so it may the maintain the drug in, in the uh, in the vessel and then block the uh, hyperplasia uh, of the inside the vessel. That's the theory. But they, I hope that it, it, it work. But uh, uh, it work well for the patient. But the, I I see I use the only, also see the quite good result. That's my uh, my practice. 
So I'm thinking about the the two years outcome of this uh, and see how. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hung. Uh, our audience actually asked a month ago, what was the percentage of intravascular imaging done in both arms? I, I believe I saw in TK slide was 5% or less. So both sides are equally low in terms of European practice. It's not different from Asian practice. Uh, Timing, you, you have a question or comment? Uh, thanks, Jack. So I think in relation to your question about the choice of stand in uh, diabetics, I think it boils down to a few factors, form, four main factors. One, whether the stand has a good expansion capability. I think most of the new generation DES uh, use uh, more biocompatible alloys, which are more flexible to implant thinner struts already. But the extension capability of the stand is actually very critical, especially in the case that's been showcased today, because it determines the ability to oppose the stand in the larger proximal main vessel, such as the left main. So in this case, the onyx stand is ideal. For example, the 4.5 can expand to 6.0. And then ideally for a left main stand, uh, it should have an open cell design, which allows the full opening of the struts towards both branches and as well as maximum area that can be achieved at the osteo side branch. This allows the operator to facilitate recrossability and then reducing the side branch compromise. And then the last but not least is how we apply the clinical data uh, to this case. I think as we did do by the second speaker, yes, the sugar trial did showed a difference in clinical results between the create and the uh, uh, and the onyx. However, um, the trial, sugar trial itself is a slightly different design. It consists of mainly 1,000 over patients in multiple centers in European country. The primary endpoint was uh, clinical in nature, uh, target region failure, uh, composite of cardiac death, MI, you know, TIR, uh, with non-inferiority design. The other trials involving uh, the onyx trial was that of the EBC main or the onyx one, multiple trials, international studies, looking at the clinical results involving complex left main bifurcations and high bleeding risk patients. So I think in, in certain um, scenarios such as this, we have to apply the trials to the right clinical context. So in this case, I think the EBC main and the Onyx one results, this su support the use of the Onyx stand uh, in this particular case. Thanks, so, uh, Timing. Good, good points as well. TK, you have a... Uh... Any final comments uh, before we go back to the CAF lab? Uh, um, no, I said that the last point made was quite good that, you know, that we should not just based on one study to look at all the uh, data in totality and, uh, and look at what subsets of patients uh, we are looking at. Yeah. And ultimately, I think the choice of stand depends again on the lesion characteristics and, uh, and the physical properties of the stand rather than actually you know, whether one subtype of stand is better than another. Yeah. Yeah, but this is a very nice uh, uh, way to put stands out and it excites people, right? So maybe my final comments on the sugar trial. So firstly, it is what it is. I, I like the way it was done, it was presented. Uh, Bida is made, there's some differences in post deal. But I, I would like to point back to the fact that in this group of patients, you saw the event rate at one year is higher than all the other trials. Because 96 to 100% of all patients are diabetic in this group compared to the other trials where it's maybe 50%. So in this group of diabetic patients, if you put in more stents, your target lesion failure or MI rate is going to be high, up to a 10% rate, I think, in real-world practice. So you really have to be very judicious in doing complex PCR in diabetic patients because they have high event rate. Even at one year, I'm sure they're going to be high at two years and then rapid catch-up at three years. So I, I think the guidelines, like what TK says, stands. This group of patient, syntax score is high, diffuse disease, maybe bypass surgery will fare better for them rather than trying to put in too many stents. I like the way TK actually alluded to the fact that because of how create EVO looks like, you're more tempted or more likely to do post deal. I, actually, I thought that was a fantastic thought. I, I would agree with that. But it does point to what everyone here has been saying. You do have to get an uh, optimal either angiographic and particularly intravascular result to have sustainable results. It's probably not just one factor like diabetes or lesion, it's multifactorial. So I, I think we have to be very careful of making conclusions here. So um, we'll go back to the CAF lab now. Maybe you can share, share screen in the CAF lab. So uh, Sutek, we're back to you uh, and we hope yeah, to yeah. see we, and we, we also get your thoughts about 
the discussion yeah. on the sugar trial when we, we delay a bit coming back to you. Aaron will uh, show what the, yeah we uh, left off the last time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you'd like to show us how we complete a DK crush in the left knee before we move on to the discussion, uh, Aaron. Finishing already. Finish, yeah. Just wait for a little while. Huh? So, so, sorry, Jack, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, okay, loud and clear. Aaron, you want to go ahead? Okay. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So we, we left you uh, when we were doing this um, uh, crushing the, the, the circ stand. Huh? So this is a placement, and then uh, we crush, uh, post dilated crush it, caught it with a 4 NC balloon, and then we. Uh, we, we, I didn't show you the, uh, when the wire go through. Yeah? So we try to aim for the middle one, yeah? middle part of the, uh, the, 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 the osteo stuck. But the thing is, sometimes you can't, you can't choose. Uh, you, you cross, then you cross. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then a 2-0 balloon actually went in very easily. Yeah, if you do a pot properly, then the, the, the balloon actually can cross quite easily, actually. So 2-0 and then 3-0. And then we did the first, uh, um, first kiss. Yeah, this is angiogram after the first kiss. And then we uh, uh, use a 3, 5, um, 22, yeah, uh, from the left main to the uh, uh, LED. So we uh, purposely missed the um, ostium because of the, on the ibis, the ostium have not much disease, but there's an angle there, yeah. But maybe it looks a little bit uh, 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 elliptical yeah, on the uh, areocranial view. So we post dilated. Uh, again, we remove the third wire because it's very important because now because there's a stand there. So if you're not careful when you push the guy in, then you may sort of crush the stand. So I think for this part, I always remove the, uh, uh, remove the wire. But the first part, you probably can leave it in. Yeah. And then we pot it. Yeah, I think uh, a proper pot is very important. So we uh, try to wire it. For this part, there's a bit of uh, 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 controversial whether you to wire the, the same mid part, proximal part or Go for the distal. So I think for me, I, I believe we should go for the distal, uh, like the old provisional uh, standing. Huh? So anyway, I, I'm not sure where I went to, <laughs> but it crossed. Yeah, it crossed. So this part is at least mid part. Lah, yeah? See the spider view and the area corner, just show um, uh, uh, you guys where we cross it. And then a 2-0 balloon, again, cross very easily. And then we use a 3-0 uh, and 3-5. Um, NC balloon both. The 3.5 in the LED, we post dilate the previous stand. Uh, and then... Uh, 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 oh yeah, so now, nowadays we like this, uh, this modified kissing balloon uh, technique. Uh, here the usual way is actually to open the, the uh, balloon into the circ and then after that uh, high pressure yeah, and, and uh, high, high pressure and then, then, then kissing and add the moderate pressure. But at the first step, uh, when we uh, uh, dilate the, the balloon in the circ, the, the stand stroke in the LED or the distal left main get pulled in. So you get a little bit distorted. So this modified uh, 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 kissing balloon technique, we dilate the left main LED balloon at a, a low pressure first, actually. Yeah. And then after that, uh, the slowly dilate the balloon in the circ. So that prevent the, uh, the distortion of the stand stroke in the first place. After that, then only we go, go high, high, and then uh, add a moderate uh, kissing uh, um, balloon technique. So this is a modified kissing balloon technique. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So after so that, we do a, uh, the, 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 the final pot. Yeah. Final the, kiss. Yeah. And then uh, uh, this is the uh, final kiss, sorry. Yeah, and then uh, we did. We, we just uh, sort of uh, optimize the distal uh, LED stand with a trio and steel balloon, and then we do the final pot. Some people don't do final pot because uh, you know uh, sometimes the final kissing actually already expand the uh, the, the stand strut and also the previous pot is already open out the, the the ostium part. But I always do it because when you you know pulling balloon in and out, sometimes you may push the, uh, distort the stand, especially when the stand is outside the ostium. Yeah, if it's inside, it's less likely, I think. But if it's outside, then you may sort of distort it. Yeah. And I think Dr. Pham, uh, from Jeming in his uh, PhD thesis, actually, he showed that uh, the final ports actually restore the geometry uh, is better, uh, to translate to a better 
um, angiographic and uh, I'm not sure whether there is a clinical outcome in that particular paper. Maybe Chen Ming can further clarify. Yeah. So in this, uh, in this, uh, the step has three ports, right? The yep. three ports, right? Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah. Three ports, two cases. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So um, this is we we did a uh, Ivers before the final angel. I just show you the final angel, and then the Chiang will will show you the Ivers. So this is the areo cranial view. As you can see, there's a lip, uh, slight sort of osteum lesion there, but I think it's just an oval shape. You can see from the from the Ivers, yeah. It's an anger. It's an angulation. It's not because of the yeah. Hmm. Oh, this one not play. Not play. Next. Next. Oh. Next one. Next one. Next. Oh yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So this is the final. Uh, it looks uh, uh, pretty uh, pretty yeah, good. It looks it uh, looks pretty amazing to me, Aaron, and uh, so take congrats. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps we can see the Ivers. And yeah, uh, yeah, sure, get sure. some uh, yeah. learning on what is considered a good final result. And, and also, Chiang, maybe you can comment uh, whether there is new carina okay, sure. <laughs> at the, uh, the LAD okay. bifurcation. Then it, it will tell us a little bit about the crossing point uh, of the, the wire. Uh, Okay. Yeah. No. Right. Okay. Go, go ahead. So this is the this is the uh, this is the circumflex final. Uh, I just we go from distal this time. So this is the distal landing zone and the OM branch. You can see the uh, stent coming in here, and there's no uh, standage dissection or hematoma, so that's pretty okay. The stent is uh, fairly well expanded. It was a two five stent, post dilated with a three o. Um, some areas of calcification there, so the stent is a little bit more irregular there. But otherwise, um, quite reasonably well expanded um, stent. Coming up to the proximal part of the circumflex towards the ostium. So here is at the ostium of the circumflex going into the left main. So I'm just going to go back and forth a little bit here. So um, always or often um, at the ostium of the circumflex, we see that it's a little bit, tends to be a little bit squashed. But anyway, the, 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 the measurement um, of the area here at the circumflex ostium is about 5.8. 5.9 uh, millimeter square. So that's pretty decent. You want to aim uh, for a final uh, um, MSA here, a uh, final stent area here in the ostium of the circ of more than five. This is the uh, polygon of confluence between the uh, circ and um, LED. And here is inside the uh, left main already. So, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll show you the pullback from the LED and talk a little bit more again. So, this is in the uh, mid LED. There's the distal edge of the stent. Again, no stent edge uh, complications there. Stent expansion is uh, uh, pretty decent. Okay, again, we move to the yeah, proximal part. This is the ostium. So I just want to show you where, where the, all the calcium was earlier. So it's around here, yeah? So around here was where the uh, all the uh, uh, calcification was earlier. And, and because of the good um, uh, a number of cracks that we managed to achieve with the OPN balloon, um, stent expansion here is actually pretty good. So here um, in the ostium of the LED, it measures about 8.3 millimeter square. That's the circumflex coming in at 12 o'clock. Here somewhere in the polygon of confluence, the area here is about 10 millimeter square. And then uh, here we are in the left main. We look at the uh, 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 proximal edge of the stand to make sure that there's no uh, malapposition, it's the aorta. So as um, uh, Dr. Lim and Dr. Wong mentioned, even though the uh, left main looked eccentric on angio, on ivus, there's not much plaque, so it's fairly healthy. And there's no uh, malapposition here in the uh, uh, proximal edge of the stand. The stand area here in the uh, left main is about 11 millimeters square. So for left main bifurcation stenting, um, the uh, you know classical kind of teaching is to try and achieve uh, minimum areas of five, six, seven, eight. So five in the ostium of the circ, six in the ostium of the LED, seven in the polygon of confluence, and eight in the uh, left main. And we've uh, uh, achieved all those um, values. Um, and the stent expansion, I've not calculated it, but um, it, 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 I think it's pretty okay. Uh, here, the distal reference um, vessel doesn't look uh, doesn't look too big, and uh, our stent uh, definitely looks bigger than that. So uh, by uh, IVAS XPL criteria. Um, we definitely uh, achieve, a, 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 you know, what, what is termed to be a, a successful IVAS result. I am not, um, or maybe I won't blame IVAS, but, but um, 
I, I can't comment on the crossing point. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> with, with OCT, perhaps. But then you don't see too much of the neocarina sticking out. So that means actually the, the wire in the circ actually cross in the, the from the mid to the distal part. Huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, at least it's not the proximal. So you don't leave too much of the neocarina hanging up. Yeah. So this is yeah, actually a very satisfying, uh, yeah, uh, angiographic and the uh, iverse uh, re yeah. result. Uh, yeah, yeah. Congratulations, Aaron's I, I, fantastic hands. I think it's a great job. Uh, yeah, I would say it's almost a perfect result if you ask me. But can I go back to uh, Chi Chi Yang actually to comment because he narrated beautifully before you guys started. You have a concentric uh, intermediate calcium that's more than six mm in length. You can't really tell the thickness, but it looks pretty bad to me. And he thought maybe you need a tractomy. But in the end, it cracked quite well on OPN. And um, looking back, would this would you have personally done a tractomy upfront based on your IVI uh, assessment? Are you asking me, Jack? Yeah, Chi Yang. Yeah. Uh, no, I probably would have. I probably would have gone with a uh, high pressure balloon dilatation. I think it. Yeah, yeah. Although you know these scores uh, try and uh, uh, help us predict uh, whether or not it's likely to be uh, difficult to expand. Um, of course, you don't always need to have pathorectomy. I think you know. I think it's proven that it was difficult to expand. Yeah, we, we saw a very bad dog boning there with the uh, uh, with the uh, NC balloon. So certainly, you know, the, the, the score or, or, or the imaging findings of uh, calcium definitely was um, uh, 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 consistent with that, right? Um, but whether or not you need atherectomy in all these cases where the score is high, uh, I guess you don't need it in all, all cases, but uh, maybe you just need to be prepared that, uh, that, 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 that you might. And it's very nice that you see Chi Yang can talk and uh, do his uh, IVERS assessment uh, parameter at the same time. He's so comfortable with it. So we, we do need to reach that level of uh, IVA assessment when we do our cases though. Uh, anyone has any comments to the case uh, proper? William, um, well, what is your take on the case? I think it's a fantastic job. Looks, as you said, um, perfect. I just want to share one tip and trick for assessing the uh, thickness of uh, calcification if we don't do OCT. So what I learned from Sinilo is that you do a stand boost with the balloon. And because uh, sometimes Ivers, you can't see the thickness. So you put the balloon and you inflate and you do a stand boost. You can actually guess that the uh, calcium is uh, quite thick. And uh, that may change your strategy. La. So I find that quite a useful tip and trick that's quite fast and convenient. Just a simple stand boost. Thanks. Uh, great tip, uh, William. Uh, Jamie, you have a comment as well? Um, fantastic case. I don't have any tips or tricks to share. I learned all my tips and tricks from my bosses in the lab. So um, just to allude to the, to the article that I think Dr. Lin mentioned. So this was actually an Asian intervention article in 2017, uh, in which we do bench testing, uh, trying to expand uh, stands in phantom models. And then the outcome was that using pot, uh, using high pressure non combined balloons, achieve uh, the most amount of stand expansion and the least amount of position. Uh, so that was a bench testing model. Uh, I just want to uh, clarify, how was, was the size of the pot uh, that was used actually uh, for the final pot? Four. Uh, four. 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 Yeah. Four. four. Okay. So. Is that uh, the appropriate size uh, Timing you were looking for or you're going with four, five, five, oh, or? Timing you're muted, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think based on the IVERS result, it looks adequate. I mean, if you increase use a larger balloon, then potentially risk of uh, intimal injury. So based on, I think the uh, IVERS readings achieve the adequate uh, areas as uh, alluded to by uh, Dr. Kang in the Korean study. So it did achieve uh, adequate stand expansion, right? I think it was 10. The MSA was on, uh, on the left knee was 10, almost 10, whereas uh, the recommendation is to hit uh, 8 mm square. So based on this, I think the size of the pot balloon is adequate. Dr. Hong from uh, Vietnam, uh, your, your comments as well. Will you have done this with the Create Evo then? Since... Uh, uh, so. Yes, the congratulations to the team in the care lab. Very fantastic case, uh, actually. 
And uh, I also use the IVERS. Uh, usually nowadays, I use a lot of IVERS for lab man intervention. And uh, I just mentioned about the uh, create evo because they I use also a lot of ONIX one ONIX as well. But so far the ONIX still okay. But the the um, sugar coming out. So let me took a, take a look at the outcome uh, of my patient. And let's see how on the diabetic patient that might uh, want to uh, inform you about the. Uh, Clinical, my clinical plastic, but about the case, I don't. I have any comment about this case because just worry a little bit about that. We have the three stand inside already. So with all this one, yeah, we uh, and we we use uh, uh, that for how long is my concern. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor Hung. Uh, maybe back to Sutek uh, and Aaron in the cath lab. There was a great debate and excitement about talking about the sugar DM trial. Um, so then Aaron, do you have uh, you use Onyx in this uh, 81 year old lady uh, with diabetes and you had perfect results on imaging? Do you think there is a difference between stents really for a diabetic subgroup? Uh, so take please. Uh, I, I leave it to Aaron to answer. No, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I think um, the difference probably is um, not 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 much as long as your uh, this I was uh, imaging guided and there's a good uh, MLA achieved. I think the outcome is pretty good. Yeah, I think for this patient, 81 years old, I, I, I would uh, want to use a short DAPT uh, 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 stent so that in any case that we need to stop the uh, uh, DAPT at some stage, we can actually stop it quite um, quite confidently. Yeah, I agree. I think that yeah, the, the procedural optimization, I think, is important. And perhaps it's not just the stand architecture configuration or the drugs uh, that matters. I think there are multiple factors that contribute. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, with, with, the, with, with the bleeding risk consideration in this elderly, I think it is perfectly OK. Uh, to, to choose the, uh, this particular stand uh, and then optimize uh, with the IVERS. I think the, Any, the result will be very good. I think the, yeah. Uh, so from the CAF lab, uh, do you have any final summary or teaching comments for our participants uh, before we go to conclusion? Either Aaron, Chiang or Sutek? Sutek. Because I think the importance of the intracoronary imaging in in uh, optimizing the PCI procedure. And then uh, plan the strategy carefully, uh, 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 even though it looks uh, angiographically, uh, but at least moderately calcified. Uh, but uh, a lot of times uh, with the guidance uh, uh, from the intracoronary imaging, can decide whether we can just use the balloon or we need arthrectomy or cutting balloon or some other devices or even the shock wave balloon. Yeah, then uh, after that, do the procedure and then uh, be familiar with all the steps. Uh, here in this case, uh, the DK crush, we discuss a little bit about the steps in the DK crush, some of the variations, but do it well. I think that perhaps the DK crush, I think the most important is that, that DK, the double kissing part actually, that perhaps make the difference. But actually you have a fair bit of matter there as well, huh? there, there will be a short segment that has a three layer of sand. Actually, yeah. So I think from the technique perspective, uh, it is the double kissing. And therefore, in some quarter, this DKQ log, the, modi the newer DKQ log techniques is also gaining some traction yeah, with the addition of that double kissing. And hopefully, that may overcome some of the, um, uh, of the disadvantages of the earlier traditional Q-lock technique. So following the proper step, planning the things carefully and um, guided by NGO and the IVERS. And uh, this hopefully will translate into a good uh, clinical outcome uh, for the patient. Aaron? Yeah, yeah I think Sutta had said it all. I think for me, my motto is always uh, keep the procedure as simple as possible. You don't want to complicate things if they it's not going to uh, uh, give you a, a better outcome or it may give you a more, more complication. Like in this case, uh, rotablation could have been used, but, um, um, but we all, I always try using a, a balloon-based therapy first to, to see whether I can crack the lesion. And in this case, actually, it, uh, it helped uh, to open up the arteries. 
uh, saving uh, 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 rotoblation, uh, arterectomy uh, devices, yeah. Chia? Um, yeah, I think uh, not much more to add to that. Um, I think it's very important to, uh, you know, when you do complex PCI to do it well the first time, uh, because when you, you know, if there's a stand complication, and you have to come back and do it a second time, it's even harder. So um, spending that little bit more time doing things uh, stepwise, uh, such as in a DK crush or DK culotte, um, uh, will save you a lot more time later on if you have to come back and deal with the, uh, with the complications. Yep. So thanks a lot uh, Elf, to uh, Chiang, Aaron, and Sute and the Cath Lab team in Singkang. Beautiful case. I'd like to congratulate you with the final uh, results as well. Um, I would now like to go to uh, final comments uh, from uh, our speakers and our guests. Uh, maybe you can start with uh, Dr. Steve Vernon first for your final uh, parting comments. Yeah, sure. I mean, I definitely want to congratulate the team. It was a, a great case and and really demonstrated a lot of the points that, that we've been discussing tonight. And I guess from my perspective, you know, a lot of the, the take-homes are really, we wanted to get optimal results in, in diabetics. It's really following that evidence base, taking the time, using your intravascular imaging, using your evidence-based strategies, if you're doing a bifurcation or a left main um, and doing it properly. In, in the case of a really great example of, of using intravascular imaging for um, I guess your, your planning and your, uh, you know, your pre-dilatation and, and dealing with that calcification. I think that was just an, an excellent demonstration. Um, and I suppose the, you know, the things, you know, these are the things that we've, we've spoken about that can, can optimize your outcome. We know that diabetics unfortunately have, you know, more aggressive disease um, and worse outcomes. So we've, we've got to make every effort uh, in them, but I think equally so, you know, these strategies, they, they absolutely translate across, across our whole practice. And um, whilst the, the outcomes may already be better in, in non-diabetics, we can improve them by adopting these, these strategies. Thanks, uh, Steve. Very good comments. Uh, as our most senior member here, uh, TK, maybe you'd like to uh, conclude the oh, session. That's an interesting comment, the most senior. Anyway, I think... <laughs> <laughs> all the tips and tricks have been given so there's nothing more to for me to give except that uh, you know it's encouraging to see that how PCI has uh, developed over the years you now we have uh, better techniques you now we have uh, we know that we need to use more imaging we have better devices maybe we have better stands now that can give us better outcome right so I think if we apply all these to our practice uh, then hopefully in the future we will be able to perform PCI for patients with diabetes and produce results that will be equivalent to what our surgeons can achieve, especially in diabetic patients uh, with multi-vessel disease. Thanks, uh, good comments. Uh, Jimmy, you have a comment? Um, I, I think in general patients that has been enrolled under RCT uh, settings wise showed superior outcomes with bypass compared with PCI. That was referenced from Syntax. Uh, stroke may be mildly increased, especially in the first one year, but overall, up to five years, patients go for cabbage has a lower composite risk of death, MI, and death. But in diabetic patients with left vein and multi vessel disease, which is uh, intermediate complexity, such as this case, I think PCR has achieved similar outcomes to bypass. This can be seen also from uh, the left main sub study of Excel. And I think uh, just now, I think Dr. Ong has uh, talked a lot about the European guidelines, but I think in the later um, ACC guidelines of 2021, uh, PCI actually can be considered as an alternative urology strategy. Uh, that's class 2A. And then they use IVERS, uh, class 2B rather, and then uh, to use IVERS as a strategy, that's class 2A. And I think with the recent advances in PCI, such as in coronary imaging, as we discussed earlier, uh, advances in lesion preparation with IVL, and new stand design, uh, thinner struts, you know, um, op uh, open cell design. Whether this translates to better outcomes still remains to be studied. And uh, the other thing is, thing, one final point I wanted to add is, ultimately the appropriate revascular modality is best discussed using a hub team approach, thinking into the account the individual patient's cardiac, extra cardiac characteristics and the preferences of a well-informed patient. And so I'm getting a lot of teaching points, so I might as well go around the table. So uh, Raj, uh, do, you, do you want to make a comment as well? Thank you. Uh, the, 
that's a great case, a beautiful demonstration of uh, DK crush in this complex lesion in an 81-year-old woman. And it highlighted one thing. I mean, PCI is getting better as we all discussed, and it's catching up with CAPG in most groups of patients. I think the final difference might be in achieving complete revascularization, uh, which we often cannot do in diabetic patients by doing PCI. And in this patient, for example, by doing a beautiful DK crush uh, at the left femur bifurcation and treating all the significant disease in the LAD and left main, I think they have, uh, the operators have achieved complete revascularization. And that's the kind of thing that will lead to good long-term outcomes and uh, make PCI durable and uh, comparable to uh, CABG. I think, so that, that's a beautiful demonstration as well in this case. So great case, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Raj. Good comment. So, Dr. Young, um, your also teaching comment. Um, I think this, um, I, I would also congratulate to the team for such a very excellent case. I think I, so many other colleagues already mentioned uh, the tip and tops um, and uh, all of the points here. But I want to just um, highlight that actually, maybe generally we are using diabetic patients to group the people uh, concerning the outcome. But actually, I think it's also different. Even for the diabetic patients, I think that diabetic itself is not really the main cause of the diffusive uh, uh, the, the lesions. I think it's mainly because of some other uh, confounding risk factors. I think we also need to take into account to uh, interpret um, the results of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the studies and comparing the results with our own patients. I think it's mainly should focus on the diffusive uh, legions and, and also the left main bifurcation patients compared with the surgical uh, strategy is the main difference. I think for the other, maybe, I mean, if there is no very diffusive uh, legions, we also observed in a lot of diabetic patients, I think maybe the results is quite comparable to the general uh, uh, patients without diabetes. I think that's also one of the points we might have to dip in and also to figure out in the further studies. Thank you. Thanks. Very good points as well. Uh, William? Well, no further points to add. Just that um, it's very important to do uh, imaging for stand optimization. That way we can have a uh, good, complete um, PCR results like what was demonstrated earlier on. Thanks, uh, William. Uh, Dr. Hung, uh, back to you from Vietnam uh, to close out the, the last. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, this is a very time fantastic case, uh, and I learned a lot from this case as well. So I just uh, um, comment uh, uh, on the uh, Dr. Lipsotek about the double kicking kilos. Actually, I am doing uh, at the moment. I doing that some uh, case with the mini kilos, double kicking mini kilos. So I th I hope that it, it work well in the when we need to stand for the patient. That's my comment because a lot uh, a lot of comment you already mentioned about the learning point. At, and the treasury of the uh, of the approach to the diabetic patient, but I hope that the mini uh, double kicking mini culot may be uh, maybe work for the by true bifurcation. That might uh, might command. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. How uh, do you think? So <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, we'll come to the hour. Uh, before I give my final thoughts, I'd like to thank all my panelists here who made excellent contribution to today's uh, session. Great talks as well as comments, I learned a lot from everyone. Congratulations to the Cavalac and Sien Kang, did a good job to add on to the illustrative uh, cases. So I, I, I want to round up by summarizing just some thoughts again, echoing what Dr. Yang said. Uh, we are too focused on looking at the calf. So I think the, the bulk of the problem with this subgroup is that they are often combined with multiple other comorbidities of advanced age, diabetes, uh, uh, calcification, stroke. So their syntax score is going to be high. Their lesion subtype doesn't really quite accommodate, stands very well for good long-term results, regardless of the stand they're going to use. So I, I think we need to be judicious about offering any intervention, actually. And I think it, we have a lot of trials showing us that if the patient is actually pretty stable, whether it's in courage or ischemia trial, we need not go in and rush in and put in stents. You should spend more time and effort managing their risk factors and going only to treat the at risk at symptom vessel or culprit lesion and not overdo it. You have enough evidence at this day and age to use physiology to strategize which lesion need to be treated. 
you have imaging to optimize your stance for more durable results. So use all those techniques and be very um, guarded about throwing too much metal, especially in the high bleeding risk patients. So I, I, I not much comment about technique, all the points have been made, but I think the main predictor for whether the lesion is going to be durable or the results going to be durable is actually the diffuseness and the complexity of the lesion over and beyond diabetes. I think diabetes may be just an adjunct risk factor, but not the only one. So I think we have to be careful about saying that, for example, diabetes is special, they are not. The, every patient is special in terms of their characteristics. So we need to be very much aware of that. My objective of the today's session, point number three, was not very flesh out how to manage this group of patients post-PCI. I think post-PCI, we really have to push for better care in terms of uh, the duration of DAPT and risk factor management. I think those continue to be our top priority, particularly for those with diffuse disease subtype, particularly for those with residual disease or still lowish FFR reading post PCI. And these are the cases that tend to have worse outcome, whether at one year or three years. So uh, please do take better care of this group of patients. And in Asia, when our diabetes rate is so high, we probably have to reduce diabetes prevalence first before we talk about good intervention. So uh, with that thought, I'd like to thank you on a Friday evening and please uh, keep safe uh, during this pandemic times. Good night, everyone, and thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs>